Good evening. Wow, we've got a, got a lot of folks for Sunday night, a lot more than we're used to. It's nice to see everybody here. Good to have you with us. We are uh, continuing a series of lessons that uh, we've been doing from questions that uh, you all have asked, uh, questions that were in the, the, the uh, ballot box that was out in the foyer, and uh, so we've been working our way through some of those, and uh, uh, tonight we actually have a, a two-for-one. Uh, we got two questions that uh, maybe didn't take as long uh, to answer, wasn't long enough maybe for, for one whole lesson, and so uh, maybe together they're too long for one lesson, but we'll find that out uh, together. Um, but uh, we'll have uh, two, two different things uh, tonight. Some of these uh, passages are, can be difficult things uh, to try to explain. Uh, some of them can be a little harder than others. When you look at uh, various different commentaries on some of the passages uh, that questions have been asked about, you'll find that there's a variety of opinions on some of these things and even within the brotherhood itself you'll find that there's a variety of opinions uh, on some of these passages. Uh, we're going to try our best to, to answer the questions and stay true to what uh, the text says. Uh, we're going to look at what the text has to say. We're going to look at the context uh, of what's around some of these passages uh, to see what that says, to see what clues uh, that will give us with regards to uh, some of these uh, passages because the, the context of the passage matters. A lot of times when we're trying to decipher something, we're trying to dig deeper into scripture, we're trying to find out you know, something that uh, looks to be confusing at first glance. Uh, when we dig deeper uh, into it, we're going to find that the context that's around that passage a lot of times is going to help illuminate for us or going to help us be able to see what's going on uh, in that particular passage. And so the context is important. Uh, sometimes it's easier to identify what isn't being taught Sometimes there are different religious groups in the world that will take some of these passages and they'll run with it and they'll, they'll teach things that violate a bunch of other scriptures. And so that's one of the things that we've got to be careful of when we start studying in scripture, when we start finding some of these more difficult passages and we come to a conclusion of a more difficult passage and that conclusion in the more difficult passage, if it contradicts something that's in a passage that's much easier and much more black and white to understand what's going on, then we made a mistake in the more difficult passage with what we've, the conclusion that we've come to. And so we've got to keep that in mind that everything needs to be able to harmonize uh, in the Bible. It, the Bible's not going to contradict itself. The Holy Spirit's not going to co contradict himself. God's not going to contradict himself. And so some of these passages may be taken to try to prove uh, Catholic doctrine, but again, if, those, if that doctrine doesn't agree with a bunch of other scriptures, then we can know that that's not true. Sometimes passages are taken to try to prove that once you're saved, you're always saved. Well, that, again, is, is not uh, going to line up with a bunch of other scriptures. And so when we come to those types of conclusions, or when people in the world come to those types of conclusions, uh, we can see that that doesn't fit the rest of the body of scripture. Um, and so we don't want to violate uh, other clearly identifiable scriptures. We don't, uh, don't want to violate things where the Bible says very easily in black and white that this is the case. Uh, and so we have two questions tonight. One of those is, what is the sin unto death? And the second question has to do with head coverings. And so we'll start with the first one. What is uh, a sin unto death? Well, this comes from John chapter, or 1 John uh, chapter 5, verses 13 through 17. That's the, the passage where this uh, comes from. And so let's take a look at what the passage has to say first off. John here writes in chapter 5, verse thir beginning in verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Confusing passage when we just read that and just look at what's said there initially, right? But there's two types of sins that are mentioned here. There's a sin that doesn't lead to death, and there's a sin that does lead to death. 
And we might read that and we start to wonder in our minds, well, what is that about? Are there some sins that are okay to commit? If I commit those, they're not going to lead to spiritual death. And so uh, I can go ahead and commit those sins and I don't have to worry about that. But the sins that lead to death, uh, is that a bigger deal? Is it, is it okay to sin if it's not a sin unto death? Well, the answer to that from various other scriptures that we read in the Bible would be no. Uh, no, it's not okay to sin. Uh, there's, there's not a time where it's okay to sin. So uh, we can look at other passages even within this. John himself says all unrighteousness is sin and there is sin not leading to death. So even though he's talking about a sin that doesn't lead to death, he defines sin here. He says all unrighteousness is sin. Well, we know that the other passages of the scripture call us to be righteous. They call us to do the right thing. They point out what is right and what is wrong, and God desires for us to do the right and to not do the wrong. And when we sin, when we do something that's wrong, well, that's, that's unrighteous. We don't want to do that. In this same letter, if we back up a few chapters to, to chapter 2, uh, we'll find that John says this, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Notice, John says, I'm, why is John writing this letter? Well, here John says himself why he's writing this letter. We don't have to go looking for it. We don't have to go searching for it. John says, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. Does God want us to sin? No. Doesn't want us to commit sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He says, I'm writing these things so that you won't sin. But if you do sin, you've got someone who's going to help you with that. You've got Jesus who's going to help you with that particular condition. Paul would agree with that. In Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about how grace is so, God's grace is so great, and God's grace is going to cover our sins. And it doesn't matter how many sins we have, that God's grace is, there's, has more grace than we have bad deeds, if you will, right? God's grace can cover our sins no matter how much we sin. And Paul anticipates that the, the brethren there in, in uh, Rome are, are going to maybe start to, to think to themselves, well, gee, if, if I, the more I sin, the more grace I receive, and maybe for bragging rights, I want to have more grace than you do, then I'm going to go out and I'm going to commit more sins than you do so that I'll have more grace, Paul anticipates that that may be an issue with what he's dealing with in Romans chapter 5. And so in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Paul says this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Should we continue to commit sin so that we get extra grace from God to cover those sins? Paul says no, right? One translation I think says heaven forbid, right? He says, certainly not. We shouldn't do that. How should we who died to sin live any longer in it? When we become Christians, when we decide we're going to follow Christ, when we're going to be a child of God, well, we need to strive uh, to, to do our best to not sin. And so the passage here isn't saying that it, well, because it's a sin that's not unto death that it's okay to commit that sin. There's something else that's going on here. Now, you, we've got a religious group in the world, and uh, I've labeled this that it's that it's not correct so that you wouldn't think that this chart represents something that's true, because it doesn't. But the Catholics take this particular passage to develop their teaching in what they call mortal sins and venial sins. They divide sin into two categories. They say that, well, mortal sins, those are the sins unto death. If you commit one of those sins, you're, you're, you're going to spiritually die. And so notice on, on the, the chart there, you've got souls that are free from sin that they believe, well, those souls are going to go straight to heaven. And they're souls with mortal sins if they've committed something like uh, wrath or murder or gluttony, right, those seven deadly sins that sometimes you'll see referenced, that if you commit one of those, well, you're, you're, gonna, you're going to hell for that particular sin because that's a mortal sin, that's a deadly sin. And then the, the venial sins, if you have those, well, then you're going to go into purgatory, uh, which is kind of like God's halfway house, and you're going to work those things off, right? Uh, I don't know if they're going to be uh, you know, hitting rocks on the rock pile or what, what it is that they do in purgatory, but that you're going to work those sins off somehow, and eventually you're going to overcome those little sins, right? You're going to, the blood of Christ in this model is not enough to cleanse you of your sins, that you have to go to purgatory and you've got to, do some sort of penance. You've got to work those things off. Or somebody back here on earth has got to pray for you to, to get you out of purgatory and into heaven. Or somebody has to donate enough money to the Roman Catholic Church so that they will open the gates and allow you out of purgatory and into heaven. If you were here a couple weeks ago, we, or I guess it's been longer than that, but we, we had a lesson on what happens when you die. 
this isn't it, right? This, this isn't it. This is different uh, than that. And so <clears throat> this isn't what the passage is talking about. And so we might say, okay, if that's, if that's not it, if the passage isn't talking about that, what, then what is uh, the passage talking about? Well, it says that there's a sin that's not unto death. Some commentators take the, the viewpoint that perhaps what he's talking about here in sins not leading to death are sins that we commit in ignorance. Sometimes we mean to do well. Sometimes we want to do the right thing. Sometimes we struggle against things that are part of our nature. We may struggle with, with anger, and we, we, try to, we try to keep that down, but, you know, somebody in the, on the road cuts us off, and, and that anger kind of flares up. But it's unintentional. We didn't, we didn't mean for that to happen, right? And so they think that, well, maybe some of these sins, the sin that's not unto death uh, is a, a sin that can be you know, repented of, or a sin that can be covered, uh, a sin that's committed in ignorance. And we, we, they make an appeal for this uh, to things that are in the old law. When you look at the, the Mosaic law, uh, especially in Leviticus, several places there it talks about those who, who commit sin unintentionally. Uh, we'll look at a few of those passages. And it's in Leviticus chapter 4 if you want the, the overall reference, but uh, we'll, we'll look at several different verses here from Leviticus 4. Beginning in verse 2, God tells Moses, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord and anything which ought not to be done and does any of them. So here's a person who sins unintentionally. And there's a sacrifice to be made, and if they make the sacrifice, uh, they will be forgiven of their sins. If you skip down in chapter 4 to verse 13, it says, Now if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done something against any of the commandments of the Lord, and anything which should not be done, and are guilty. Uh, again, there's a sacrifice that can be made for that. Notice, the, it's the whole nation now that is sinning, right? But they're doing something unintentionally. But even though it was unintentional, it says they're guilty, right? It says that they're guilty. But they can offer a sacrifice, and they can be forgiven for that. Skip down to verse uh, 22. When a ruler has sinned and done something unintentional against any of the commandments of the Lord, uh, his God, and anything which should not be done and is guilty, then again there's a sacrifice that can be made. Now these sacrifices are different. The animals uh, are different depending on what class or what status you are uh, in the nation of Israel. But in all of these, it's a person who sins unintentionally. If you skip down to verse 27, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally by doing something against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done and is guilty. Notice, even though it's unintentional sin, it's, there's guilt there. And there's a sacrifice that had to be made in order for them to get forgiveness of that. And so you've got these sins that are committed unintentionally. Now, if you come over to Numbers chapter 15, you'll see that there's, there's a difference here between sins that are committed unintentionally uh, and the sins that are maybe more deliberate. There's a distinction that's made here in Numbers chapter 15, uh, beginning in verse 27. It says, And if a person sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in its first year as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally. When he sins unintentionally before the Lord to make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. You shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally, for him who is native-born among the children of Israel, and for the stranger who dwells among them. But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native-born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people. Because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. You've got a distinction that's made here between the person who sins unintentionally, who's trying to do the right thing, and the person who has a presumptuous sin or a heavy-handed sin. Right? They, they say, well, I, I know that the Lord says don't do this, but I like doing it, and so I'm going to do it anyways, and I don't care what the Lord has to say. That's a high-handed sin. That's a presumptuous sin. And for that person, they were to be cut off from among their people. Now, that doesn't mean that they were going to be exiled. It means that they were going to receive the death penalty for that. And God's word says that their guilt was going to be on their own head. And so sometimes commentators will look at this and, and they'll say, uh, you've got a sin here that's unintentional that can be atoned for, and God's going to forgive that, but you have other sins that 
are, are done with a, with a heavy hand or a high hand, or they're done presumptuously, uh, and they're treated differently. Uh, and so they would make a, a, the sin that's unto death something that's done intentionally, but that would be kind of one sin in, in their estimation. And in, in how they look at this, it would be this one sin was done intentionally, and so it's harder to get forgiveness for that, especially if we continue uh, in that sin. Rather than one specific sin, however, uh, this passage looks to be talking about a lifestyle. Looks to be talking about a lifestyle. There are sins that are going to be covered by the blood of Christ. There are sins that are going to be a sin unto death that aren't going to be covered by the blood of Christ, and it has to do with our lifestyle. If you back up uh, a little bit further in 1 John, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, uh, it talks about that particular lifestyle, that if we walk in the light, he says, Right? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so when he talks about a sin not leading to death, if we are walking in the light as he is in the light, Jesus' blood continues to cleanse us from our sins. And so when we do sin... Well, that's a sin not leading to death. That's, and we can pray for one another in those particular instances. We can get cleansing for those sins. When one responds to the invitation, if, if I'm committing sin and, and uh, I'm walking in the light and I'm trying to do my best, but I commit a sin and I feel sorry about it and it's known publicly, and I respond to the invitation and we pray for that person, right? And what is it that we're praying for? Praying for God to forgive them of what it is that they've done. Sometimes we call that the second law of grace, that once we've been baptized, if we commit sin, we can repent of that, we can ask for forgiveness, we can ask our brothers and sisters to pray for us, and the prayer of a, of a righteous man, right, is, is an effectual thing. It accomplishes much. And so we can come and we can ask for the prayers, and we should pray for people's sins to be forgiven in that state or in that condition. You got Acts chapter 8. Simon the sorcerer, when the apostles come to Samaria, he witnesses them laying hands on people and bestowing upon them spiritual gifts, and they're giving the Spirit to, to people. And Simon sees that, and uh, he knows what he's been doing to fool people for a long time. He's been baptized. He's become a Christian, right? Uh, so he's, he's been obedient to the faith. But when he sees this, he asks the apostles, hey, can I give you some money and you give me that ability so that I can do this? Because he wants to show off with it, right? He's not wanting to use it uh, for religious purposes, if you will. He, he maybe sees some dollar signs behind this. And Peter rebukes him. He says, your, your money perishes with you. You need to pray to God and ask him to for this not to come upon you. And so Simon asks the apostles to pray for him, right? That because he has sinned and what it is that he has thought. He's sinned and what it is that he's wanting to do there. And so they pray for him, right? That's an effective prayer to, to pray for someone. So when we look at 1 John chapter 5, he says, you know, that we are to ask God and God will forgive uh, their sins. That if we pray for them, right? If it's a sin not leading to death, we can pray for them about that and God will forgive their sins. But there are other sins that John indicates our prayers won't help. And that's if folks are walking in the darkness. If folks are walking in the darkness, then their sin is a sin that's unto death. Because they're not walking in the light. They don't have the blood of Jesus cleansing their sins. They're walking in darkness. Notice uh, what he says about walking in darkness here in 1 John chapter 1. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him in verse 6, and walk in darkness and, do, and lie, we lie and do not practice the truth. Right? So if we're walking in darkness, we're lying, we're not practicing the truth, we're, it's a lifestyle that I think he's talking about here. If we're walking in the light and that's our lifestyle that we're trying to do the best that we can, well, then the blood of Christ is going to cover us from our sins. Those are going to be sins not unto death. And we can pray for one another for those sins to be forgiven. But if a person's walking in darkness and they continue to walk in darkness, if they continue to lead a lifestyle of sin, we can pray for them to return to the fold of safety. We can pray for them to repent. We can pray that God will help us say something to them that will help them to turn their lives around. But if we pray for, to God for their sins to be forgiven while they refuse to repent and they continue to live in that lifestyle, 
John says it's not going to do any good. Not going to do any good to pray and ask God to forgive their sins in that state. They've got to be willing to repent. They've got to be willing to turn around. They've got to be willing to have a change of mind uh, in that particular case. This goes along with what's written over in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26. You got folks that have made a total rejection of Christ. The Hebrews writer says here in chapter 10, verse 26 and 27, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. If we willfully turn our backs on Jesus and we walk away from him, the Hebrews writer says there is no other sacrifice for sins. Where are you going to go? You turn your back on Christ, you don't want to accept Christ's sacrifice for your sins? You can sacrifice as many animals as you want. The Hebrews writer said earlier in chapter 10 that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. It isn't going to do any good. It isn't going to remove those things. So there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but what, what remains? A certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. If we turn our backs on Jesus and walk away, we're not, his blood's not going to cleanse us from our sins. Our sins are going to lead unto death. They're going to lead unto spiritual death. They're going to lead unto that death in the next life. It goes along with the context of, of 1 John as well. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19, he talks about false teachers who had fallen away. Notice what he says here. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. There were folks that were going out amongst the people and they were false teachers and they were claiming to be from the apostles. But John says, no, they, they weren't from us. They, they started, they originated from us, but they fell away. Uh, and they were, they were teaching falsehood. And we already noticed in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 that those who are walking in darkness, they don't have fellowship with God. And if they don't have fellowship with God, they don't have fellowship with God's people either. There's a break there. The blood of Christ isn't covering their sins. They're sinning uh, unto spiritual death. Notice in 2 John, verses 9 through 11, John there says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. John says there's some folks who can't pray for their sins to be forgiven because they're not walking in the light, they're walking in darkness. There's some folks that we can't be in fellowship with because they're not in fellowship with God, they're walking in darkness. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't try to help them. It doesn't mean that we don't try to reach out to them. It doesn't mean that we don't try to share with them the love of Christ and the, and the gospel and the good news to, to try to help them to turn the ship around. We're told that over in Galatians chapter 6, right, that we who are spiritual should help one who has fallen away. And so we need to do that. We can pray to God to overlook their sins, but without repentance on their part, it's not going to be very effective. You know, what's interesting is sometimes you'll, you'll look for answers for these various different things, and AI has become a big thing. And I guess it depends on who programs AI. But a lot of times people look at these passages, and maybe they've got some bias because of their denominational group that they belong to, or maybe they've got some, some bias because of emotions and, and other things that enter in. You know, AI doesn't have any of that emotional baggage, and AI doesn't have any of that bias as long as it's been programmed to just look at the passages. I thought it was interesting what AI had to say about this particular uh, passage. It says the phrase, the sin that leads to death, is found in the Bible specifically in 1 John 5.16. Among Bible scholars, there are different interpretations, but the strongest view is that it refers to unbelievers who deliberately refuse to believe in Jesus Christ and promote false teaching. And I thought that was really a pretty good answer. And until somebody gets in there and starts monkeying with the programming of the AI, uh, you can maybe sometimes take the emotion and everything else uh, out of the equation by looking at what it has to say. So hopefully that answers the question about what that is. What is a sin uh, unto death and what is a sin not unto death? Because again, on the, on the surface of it, it can look to be confusing. And so we'll, we'll turn the page and uh, we'll talk about head coverings. Head coverings are spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, a passage that begins pretty much at the beginning of the chapter. The, the context of it begins up around verse 3. 
Paul says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. If, for if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. Judge among yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Again, it can be a confusing passage to look at and confusing to, to understand what's going on here. It, it looks to be a command from God. And the, the two main verses that are in this passage that are often referred to uh, are in verses 5 and 6. Uh, the ASV uh, refers to veils here. Every woman praying or prophesying with her head unveiled dishonoreth her head, for it is one and the same thing as if she were shaven. For if a woman is not veiled, let her also be shorn. But if it's a shame to a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be veiled. Um, and so the question that, that comes from this is, is it a command? Is it a command by God for women to be veiled uh, during the worship assembly? Is it something that we should be doing uh, today? If this is what God wants, if this is a command from God, the instructions here uh, are pretty scarce, uh, and they're pretty vague as far as what uh, is, is to be done. It's only listed here uh, without any further instructions. Now, admittedly, the passage uh, is difficult. There are two basic uh, opinions uh, on this particular topic within the brotherhood itself, that women are to be veiled today in worship. Uh, Brother Wayne Jackson, who was in California, uh, he took that position, and a lot of uh, other folks that listen to Wayne Jackson uh, have taken that position, that women should be veiled uh, in the worship assembly. I, I, we knew of several uh, folks that, uh, when we went to homeschool roundhouse, that uh, were... were uh, uh, had listened to Brother Jackson's teaching on that, and, and they, their uh, women were, were veiled when they were in the worship assembly. Uh, the other opinion is that women today are not required to wear veils, uh, that uh, the idea is that this instruction from Paul to the Corinthians was something that was cultural, that it only had to do with what was going on in Corinth, that it was just a cultural issue for them there and wasn't a command for everyone. So let's dig into this a little bit and see what's here. Let's first understand what is the veil? What are we talking about when we talk about a veil or we talk about a covering? Uh, is it the woman's hair? In 1 Corinthians 11:15, it says, If a woman has long hair, it's glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. So is, is the covering that he's talking about hair, that women are supposed to have long hair and men are supposed to have short hair, if that's what uh, he's getting after, uh, this the hair would cover the woman's head, and so she would be covered with regards to what's written in 1 Corinthians 11. But notice in that text also it says that the man's head is not to be covered. And so if we're talking about hair, then the only way that men could approach God would be if they were bald. So do we? You know, we're, we're in pretty good shape, right? <clears throat> so it, it doesn't seem to make sense that we would be talking about hair because the man, man's head being uncovered would mean that we would have to, we would have to be bald in order to be able to approach God. The word uh, that is here that is used for veiled, or the word that is used here that is used for covered, depending on what translation you have, is a Greek word, katakalupto. And I understand that's a mouthful. Uh, yeah, that's how it's spelled uh, in the Greek. That's how it's kind of transliterated into English. But katakalupto, a katakalupto means to, to cover, to conceal, to hide, or to, to bury. And it's used here for, for veiling or for covering, but the, the word was used for something that is completely covered or completely hidden. Uh, notice over in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 28. 
In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word is here in verse 28, then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, not so much as one of them remained. And so they were covered with the water, right? They, when the sea returned to its full strength, Pharaoh and his chariots <clears throat> and his soldiers, they were completely covered. They weren't just kind of partially covered, right? They were completely covered over. In Exodus chapter 26 and verse 34, it talks about that they're going to put the ark behind the veil. It says, you shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the, that most holy place. And in that most holy place, we talked about that this morning, that there was a veil there in Bible class, right? There was a veil that nobody went back there except the high priest, and he only went back there once a year. And that veil kept that ark completely covered so that they wouldn't see it. They wouldn't see any, any part of it that it was back there. In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12, again in the Septuagint translation, catacalupto is there. It says, hate stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. How many sins? It says, love covers all sins. Now, Peter quotes this in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, and so we've got this idea in the New Testament as well. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, Peter says, for love will cover a multitude of sins. It will cover them over. It's not going to leave some of them uh, hanging out, if you will. And so when we talk about a catacalupto, you know, covering over, which is catacalupto, and the covering itself would be a catacalupti, so when we're talking about that kind of veil or that kind of covering, that kind of covering would completely cover their heads. And so when we're talking about this type of a veil, it would be more akin to something that is either a burqa or a, a hijab, right? If I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hijab, right? Um, so it would be similar to that. It would, it would cover their hair completely. You wouldn't see uh, any of their hair at all. A woman's hair or head would be completely covered. Now, I understand women today, they're wanting to fulfill the commandments of the Lord. When, when women wear veils, they're wanting to do what the Lord commands, and that's commendable, that they have that kind of spirit, that they want to do that. They want to do what the Lord requires. They, 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 they don't want to offend uh, the Lord in any way. And so I think that's commendable that they want to do that. But there's evidence for this being cultural, that this applies to the culture of Corinth and the culture of Corinth only and is not something that's a more universal command uh, for all of us. The veil in Corinthian society was a sign of submission. Women who were married would wear the veils and it would indicate that they were married as much like we would wear a wedding ring today to indicate that we are married. And if the women in Corinth are casting their veils off, they are, they are casting off that authority that's on their head that would be their husband, right? There is kind of like uh, saying that uh, they're not going to take that anymore, right? It would be like saying that they're not in submission within their society. And so in their culture, removing the veils would be saying they're not in submission. And so Paul's telling them there in Corinth, you need to have that veil on your head. You need to have that symbol of authority on your head. You need to show that you're in submission because of what we talked about uh, in our lesson this morning, if you were here for that with regards to the role of women. And so removing the veil would be like saying they're not in submission within their society. And submission is in the context of this passage. When you look at the very beginning of this passage, the very first verse that we looked at in verse 3, Paul says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. He's talking about a pecking order, right? <laughs> talking about submission there, talking about who has authority. The, the man has authority over him, it's Christ, right? Christ has authority over him, it's God the Father. Right? The woman has, has a man in authority uh, that's over her, and that's what Paul's talking about here. But since that catacalupti, right, since that would cover her hair completely, it wouldn't, her hair wouldn't be seen at all. And we don't see this command given to any other church. Paul doesn't write this to any other group except for the, the group that's here in Corinth. So we don't see it given to any other church. As a matter of fact, in Ephesus, the woman's hair could be seen. Paul writes to Timothy, and Timothy is in Ephesus. And when Paul writes to Timothy in Ephesus, he says, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. And so here Paul's talking about what modest apparel is and what, how the women are to dress and how they're to take care of themselves. And it appears that some of the women were spending an inordinate amount of time on fixing their hair so that they could be seen 
uh, by other people so that they could be seen by other men. And Paul's saying, don't spend all that time on your hair. Now, why would they be doing that if their hair was completely covered and nobody could see it? The, the hair in Ephesus uh, could be seen. He's in, in instructing them because their hair was visible. It was not veiled. Uh, and this would indicate to us further that the, the wearing of veils wasn't something that was a command in all the churches, even in the first century itself, that it looks like it was just cultural there within uh, Corinth itself. Indeed, Paul says at the end of all of this, if anyone seems to be contentious, uh, that we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. So if anybody is contentious about the wearing of veils, if anybody's contentious about, you know, doing what would be normal in their culture, he, he sort of sums this section up by saying we don't have any such custom within the church. There's no command that's given here uh, in the church. Also, it says if she's not veiled, she should be shaved, but there's, there's not a Bible passage that indicates that if a woman shaves her head, that that's some sort of shame to her. Or that if, but in the Corinthian culture, if you were a prostitute, I believe they, if they arrested you for that, they would shave your head, right? It was a disgrace. But it was a disgrace within their culture. And so he's talking about something that is in, again, their culture and not something that's, that's universal with regards to, can a woman shave her head today? There's no passage that teaches that she couldn't. You know, but if in our culture that would indicate something, then, then maybe we, we think about that. We don't cave into the culture because culture doesn't trump what the scriptures have to say. But sometimes we can see that these things are, are cultural. And so this would indicate that the passage is dealing with something cultural. So what is Paul dealing with in this passage? What's he really getting after here? It looks like he's dealing with the same issue that we looked at this morning, and that's proper roles within the church. Sometimes people want to take this passage from 1 Corinthians 11, and they want to try to set it against what Paul says in chapter 14, verse 34, that a woman should be silent, because it says, well, here you've got women who are praying and women who are prophesying, and Paul seems like he's okay with that as long as their, their head is covered. Well, he, he looks like he's talking about them being in a different gathering, that they may be in a gathering just with women only. Because he doesn't start talking about them coming together in the assembly until you get to verse 17 in 1 Corinthians 11. Now about your coming together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. He says, I don't commend you in what it is that you're doing because you're... So he's got a problem with the Lord's Supper that he's going to talk about. But I think what he talks about here in 1 Corinthians 11 goes along perfectly well with what he has in chapter 14. I th think he's in the same context. And he's just, he's not getting to that silent part until we get over to chapter 14, but he's talking about proper roles. It would not be proper for the man to have his head covered by the woman. So he's supposed to be in that position of authority, right? And so if his head is covered by the woman, well, that, that wouldn't be desirable. That's not what God wants. If the woman were to uncover her head, if she were to say, I'm not under the authority of the man and I can do my own thing, well, that wouldn't be proper either. And so in the whole context, it looks like that's what it is that's being talked about here. It fits well with that. It appears as if some of the Corinthian women had cast off their veils. They had taken charge maybe in the assembly. And Paul's saying, don't do that. that that's, not your, that's not your proper role within the worship assembly. This would make the wearing of veils in our culture an optional thing. Now, if it would violate your conscience to, to not wear a veil, then I would say wear your veil. Don't violate your conscience. Uh, if you're not convicted in your conscience, if you still believe that that's what you should do, then, then do that. But this does not appear to be a command for women to, to wear veils today. If you have more questions about this, yeah, I'll be happy to answer those afterwards. But while these passages can be a little more difficult to understand, it's not impossible. I, I've been enjoying this series very much. This digging in and uh, answering these questions has, has forced me to kind of look at some of these things in, in, uh, more than I have in the past uh, and, and do more study on them, to study a little bit deeper on some of these issues. And, um, and so I've enjoyed uh, doing this series of lessons on these questions very much. The main thing to keep in mind is that we can't take a position that violates other scriptures that we can clearly see. Right? Paul says women are to be silent in the assembly in chapter 14 and verse 34. It's pretty clear and pretty straightforward. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, he talks about how the women are not to be the ones that are the teachers in the mixed company and that they are not to usurp the authority of the females, of the, of the, of the men, and that... Uh, uh, again, it seems pretty, pretty clear-cut, pretty straightforward. He makes an appeal to the fact that Adam was formed first and then Eve in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13, that this goes back to the creation order, which, if you noticed in our passage in 1 Corinthians 11, 
Paul makes reference to the creation order there as well with regards to why these things are the way that they are. So whatever conclusion we come to as we study these passages, it must fit in with the greater context of biblical teaching. Hopefully, uh, this lesson tonight has been helpful in clearing some of these things up or understanding these or having a better understanding of these passages. Because we want to know what God means by what he has written. It's important for us to know what it is that God means. The meaning of Scripture is not determined by us. It doesn't mean something different to us than it does to somebody else. God means what he means, and our job is to discover what it is that God means by digging into these passages. What God means about salvation is important, and it's something that is a little easier, thankfully, for us to be able to figure out what it is that God wants us to do in order to be saved. He says we've got to be able to hear his word. We've, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Once we've heard it, it doesn't need to be something that goes in one ear and out the other. We've got to believe it to be true. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins, John chapter 8, and I believe verse 24. He says over in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please him, for those who come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We have to be willing to confess him before men, to say that we pledge allegiance to Jesus, that we accept him as our, both our Lord and our Savior. A lot of people want Jesus to be their Savior. They want Jesus to wipe out their sins and to wash away their sins. But they're not willing to accept him as Lord and do the things that he says to do. We've got to confess that we accept Jesus as both our Lord and our Savior and that we're going to be in allegiance with him. We have to be willing to repent of the things that we see that we're doing wrong. If we find that we're doing something that is against what is taught in Scripture, we have to be willing to make that change. We don't want to be sinning and not have our sins covered because of the lifestyle that we lead. We need to be baptized for the remission of our sins. That's where we meet the blood of Christ. That's where we have our sins washed away so that they won't be accounted to us anymore, that he's not going to take those into account on Judgment Day. But it'll be as if, right, just as if we had not sinned. We can be justified in the eyes of God. If you haven't done that, we invite you to come forward and take a seat in one of these front pews and we'll see what we need to do to, to get you to that point. Maybe you've done that, but you've not been walking faithfully. You've not been walking in the light. We can help you with that too. We can pray to God for you, for your sins to be forgiven if there's something that you've done that needs to be repented of. Why don't you let your need be known by sitting in one of these front pews as we stand with Mark and as we sing.